Hello, everyone. Hello, Grandmaster. Today is a very auspicious and special day. I would like to connect with all of you who are destined to be here and help you gain a deeper understanding of the great compassionate medicine Buddha. I believe that after listening, you will develop a very warm understanding of Medicine Buddha. We will develop a sense of respect, a heart of offering, and a pure mind. In the Buddhist scriptures, it is recorded that before attaining enlightenment, Medicine Buddha was just like any other sentient being, practicing and wishing to make a vow. He envisioned a very bright and beautiful future for himself. Once, after a long period of preparation and deep contemplation, Medicine Buddha made a series of the most sacred and great vows. These are the twelve great vows of Medicine Buddha. I have summarized these twelve great vows into four categories. He is deeply concerned about us humans. He cares greatly about humanity, especially about the real issues in our lives and our survival. The most practical issue he hopes to solve for humanity is achieving physical health and perfection. He wants to help people who have various disabilities, such as being deaf, mute, having a hunchback, being blind, those having congenital intellectual disabilities, or those who are born particularly ugly. He also addressed various diseases and infectious illnesses, like the current pandemic. How do you fight illness? How do you recover from disease? He hoped that after hearing the name of Medicine Buddha, the name of Medicine Buddha Tathagata, all your problems will be resolved. You will no longer have any illness. You'll have a healthy body and complete limbs. And you will be wise and intelligent, even becoming handsome or beautiful. He even considered our appearance. For those who are sick and poor, without family or caretakers, if they worship Medicine Buddha, they may quickly receive support from people around them. We Chinese have a saying, when you're poor, no one cares. When you're rich, even distant relatives come. Isn't it true? If you're very poor, even if you live in the city center, it seems like you have no relatives to help you. If you suddenly become wealthy or gain power, you'll suddenly find many relatives you've never heard of before. Like your second aunt's father's siblings. They all come looking for you, right? They'll tell you that in the past, their grandpa took care of your poor grandpa. Although they didn't do that, rather their grandpa did. Now you should take care of them to repay the kindness. Right? That's how it goes. When you were little, I held you. Oh, you don't remember that, do you? You were two days old then. Of course, you wouldn't know that. Is there anyone born into a poor family with few relatives? Later, you grew up and became successful. Your family became wealthy. 
It seems like you have more relatives and friends now, right? Yes. If you are poor and sick and can't afford medical treatment, and if you have no relatives, friends, or even a home, once you show respect to the Medicine Buddha, you'll have a home. For example, if you respect Medicine Buddha and have no home, it's okay. The meditation center is a home for all friends. Our meditation center provides almost all of your basic needs, such as meals, tea, or coffee. A place to chat or even to chant Buddha's name together. You can also practice energy bhagwa here or do some things to serve others. Besides practicing here, you should also help others. Our center represents Buddha's home. Buddha is here to help all. Such a great divine being deserves our respect. You come to your home, our meditation center. You need to do something to feel fulfilled, right? If you have a home, and you do nothing for it, you won't be healthy. Only by working can we find ourselves and eventually achieve health and happiness. Therefore, Bodhi Meditation Center is the home for all beings with a connection. Everyone is always welcome to come, come home to eat and drink. The Meditation Center is for all who love to practice and respect Medicine Buddha. The first major focus is on the most practical issue of all beings, which is health. The second major issue is rarely addressed by other Buddhas. Medicine Buddha is practical. Having money is more important than being good looking. If one can't even afford to eat, can this person still look vibrant and healthy? So, if we don't have money to buy food, we can't be healthy. We can't look good either, right? Without money, do you have a home? No. You may have a home, but there's nothing in it. Except for the two people inside, there's nothing. I remember that a few years ago, we visited some families on small islands in Malaysia. They had several children, but when we went to their homes, there was nothing. A friend of mine sent me this story from Brazil. In the capital, there's a slum area. He went to a family's house and asked for a drink of water. He actually wanted to see what their home looked like. He found out they had nothing. The couple had four kids, but not even a bed. He thought there might be more rooms, but there was only that one. In that room, a toilet was next to the kitchen. They had nothing but some leftover porridge. He asked, Is this your home? They said, Yes. He asked, What about dinner? They replied, We'll see. They eat one meal at a time, never knowing about the next. So, in our world today, there are still many people like this. Meals are always scarce. There's just not enough money for food let alone to support children's education. Many parents can't even find jobs. So, the issue of poverty affects all of humanity. Economic security is a fundamental basis for a good and healthy life. So, economic issues are something that everyone must address. If you respect, believe in, and praise Medicine Buddha, as Medicine Buddha said, I hope you will become wealthy in the future. Everyone will have clothes to wear, a house to live in, and many good friends. Every day, friends will visit your home. There will be parties to which you're invited. Yes, wealthy people are busy attending banquets. Medicine Buddha said, if you respect him, you will become wealthy in the future. So, everyone, quickly worship Medicine Buddha. This is the second major category, so practical. What about the third category? 
It spans from ancient times to the present. There are many ways that lead people astray. What behaviors are considered to lead people astray? Drug use, someone mentioned. Yes, drug use. Gambling, fraud, and robbery. Robbery is more ruthless. If you don't give the money, they'll kill you. We have a traditional culture. In Chinese novels, whenever one is poor, they become like the mountain king. Being a mountain king comes with its own sayings. Do you know them? Let me teach you. This road was opened by me. This tree was planted by me. To pass this road, you need to pay a toll. Do you have to pay the toll? Yes. If you don't pay, you can't pass. So, I pay every day. I've gotten used to it now. There are various ways to collect the toll. You just need to load money onto a card. When your car passes, poof, your money is gone. Just a poof, and it's gone. That's how it is. A decade ago in Korea, it was the same. They paid by waving their phones. At the highway exit, you'd wave your phone by the window. They had a scanner, they would just scan it. They'll take your money. So fast. In Malaysia, it's dangerous for women to stand by the roadside. This is why I always oppose women carrying branded, beautiful bags. The robbers don't rob people like me, only weaker women, who often carry expensive bags. They easily succeed, right? Unlike highway tolls, when you're standing by the roadside, you get robbed without consent, right? You didn't wave your phone or swipe a card. They just rob you and your bag together. The scariest part is, when they snatch the bag, they pull you down. You may hit the back of your head. Usually, it won't kill you, but it will cripple you. It can cause serious problems. So, women carrying designer bags, please switch bags. Okay? Ah. Hmm. From ancient times to now, many industries have led people astray. Some clearly lead people astray while others do so subtly. Many mothers come to me, saying, Master, my son plays games all day, without sleeping or brushing his teeth. He skipped school just to play games. He's going astray. Master, how can I correct him? Do you think just playing games all day is going astray? Yes. Kids are losing money while playing games. Not gambling games, but regular ones. Although the game brings you joy, playing it every day for long hours wastes your time. Kids are going on the wrong path. Two hours would be too much. Playing a little as entertainment to refresh your mind and mood is fine. But don't play too much. Also, avoid games with gambling elements. Even if it's not gambling, limit your time. Why does mom say you're on the wrong path? You'll ruin your studies, career, and health. That's also going down the wrong path. Friends, think, what else is the wrong path? Insulting, slandering, and using harsh words. Doing these things is also going astray. What does this lead to? It leads to harm. Right? I insult you, truly insult and slander you. It causes distress. Many assaults, even murders, start with slander and insults. You scold me, I might be able to tolerate it. You insult my mother, I hit you. You insult my grandmother, I will kill you. That's how the conflict begins. Buddha spoke even deeper, because this is about the spiritual world. For example, if someone goes astray, I must correct them. Earlier, we mentioned murder, arson, robbery, theft fraud, drug abuse, and so on. These are more obvious. In the spiritual world, everyone has some kinds of distorted views. What are they? They are the five poisons of life. Greed, anger, ignorance, arrogance, and doubt. Greed, you can't see it. 
But what does greed lead to? We can't list all the examples. It's greed that drives people to rob, murder, defraud, and kidnap, right? Beating an innocent person, snatching bags on the street, even breaking into homes to steal money. These are all due to greed. So, greed, anger, ignorance, arrogance, and doubt. Anger, right? How does anger arise? You insult me, I get angry. What else fuels my anger? Is it just because you insulted me? Or is there more? Does jealousy make one burn with anger? Does jealousy harm others? Can it lead to killing? Jealousy is one of the five poisons. Even many wars between countries stem from jealousy between two kings. What happens with jealousy? War. Today, your country has nuclear weapons, right? My country doesn't even have conventional weapons. I'm very angry. I'd rather let everyone starve so I can make atomic bombs. There are two families. One family bought an expensive motorcycle, a big one. The kind that's most annoying at night. It sounds like a cannon, right? Wouldn't another family, as their neighbor, be angry? Not because it's loud, but because it's expensive. You think, if I had money, I'd buy a car, a small car. Your neighbor drives an old small car. You don't even have an old car. Wouldn't you be angry? Jealousy turns into anger. Then, let's see arrogance. You may not realize your arrogance, thinking, I have more money than others. I'm better looking and healthier than others. When those who are good looking and knowledgeable are with others, they see everyone else as ordinary. I once visited a professor at his home. He said, Master, you're here. This is the tea I don't serve to ordinary people. I asked, what tea? I've aged this poor tea for two and a half years just for you. I said, the shortest time I've aged mine is seven and a half years. He exclaimed, yours is better. He said, ordinary people don't know poor tea. I said, professor, so who are you? Then I guess I can be considered a commoner, he said. At least, that's how he felt. He is falling into arrogance again. He's usually very nice to people. When his neighbor got rich, he stayed the same, wearing clothes from over a decade ago. I'm like this, not envious of others at all. He's knowledgeable, so he's content inside. He doesn't care about common people when they buy cars, houses, and so on. He doesn't care at all. But does he make mistakes? Has he made any mistakes? He made a mistake just now, calling others commoners. Look at us, the uncommon people. We all drink poor tea that's at least two and a half years old. You're too inferior. Those who sell tea are like immortals. Arrogance is thinking you're knowledgeable. One should be a noble person. So, you see, evil means taking a wrong or crooked path. While it can also be wrong views and wrong perceptions. When one's level is insufficient, one naturally deviates. Buddha said he would help correct us. As long as you respectfully praise and worship Medicine Buddha, you will return from all wrong paths and views to the most correct path of right knowledge and right views. This is very important. This mental state actually truly determines the height of our lives and our happiness. This spiritual realm is more important than physical health. This is the third major gift from the Buddha. The fourth one is actually quite easy to explain. The Buddha has a great wish. He said that no matter what work you are doing, whether you are educated or cultured, 
no matter how troubled and painful your life is. I hope and am willing to help you. In the future, you can all become enlightened like me. You can all achieve perfect merit and become Buddhas. This is the most noble and touching wish of the Buddha. If only you worship and believe in Medicine Buddha, he'll help and guide you in the future, leading you to achieve true perfect merit and Buddhahood. So, let's speak in more worldly terms. To be more realistic, it is the Buddha's great wish. So, what should we do? How can we better receive the protection, help, and guidance from Medicine Buddha? First, we must believe. You must believe in the words of Medicine Buddha. Otherwise, you won't proceed. Next, you need to study and connect with him, to make offerings to and serve him. If you don't believe, you won't take the next steps. You won't offer to Medicine Buddha if you don't believe in his words. So, you must believe. Only then can you proceed to offering and devotion. Offering means taking action. Secondly, what do we offer? In Southeast Asia, even a small flower, a piece of fruit, or a bowl of rice is an offering. It comes from a sense of reverence in our hearts. For example, we show respect to our parents and elders. When my mother turns 60, I prepare a special meal for her. Isn't that an offering? Yes, it is. When offering to Buddha, we should at least show the same reverence we show to our parents. Yes, if you have faith, you should make offerings including offering to the statues of the Buddha, images of Medicine Buddha, and the scriptures of Medicine Buddha. If the chance comes, I'll explain more on the benefits of offering to the Buddha statues and scriptures. As long as you worship Buddha statues and the scriptures of the Buddha, within about 1,000 square kilometers around your residence, it will all be auspicious. I said at least your family will be blessed. That's for sure. You will receive protection. So, what about the third one? The third is quite similar to the second. It makes offering and supporting more specific. Previously, we mentioned offering delicious food, fruits, and vegetables. You can also offer your own skills. For example, if I have time, I volunteer at meditation centers. If I have time, I go to the Bhagwa site to help others find relief and happiness. I can help them practice, gain health, and so on. There are many, many ways to offer support. Many people say, if I have money, I use it to build temples. Use money to create Buddha statues, print Buddhist scriptures. Use money to help the poor relieve suffering. All of these are ways. The key is to have a heart of offering. Coupled with the act of offering, this is true offering. With these, faith is formed. Faith comes from absolute belief. Faith, in this context, means reliance. It implies looking up to and depending on. When we face troubles and difficulties, we seek guidance from the Buddha. At the very least, the Buddha blesses us, gives us strength and confidence. Or, our fellow practitioners who are more advanced can receive Medicine Buddha's blessings, inspiration, and guidance. Fourth, because of faith, I believe in the benefits the Buddha brings me. To gain more benefits, we should constantly chant the Buddha's name. Chant Buddha's name whenever possible. Can you chant the Medicine Buddha's mantra? Yes. Chant whenever you have time. Keep the mantra in mind. When something happens, whether good or bad, or when something inauspicious is about to occur, first, Medicine Buddha will give us a warning. You will receive an inspiration. Secondly, 
it can help us avert disasters. For example, in your life, at this age, this year is your zodiac year. Something might happen, let's assume, like a minor traffic accident. If your intention is weak, and if your respect is not enough, due to the respect you do have, the bad thing will still happen. However, the harm will be much reduced. Even if you're not sincere enough, you will receive protection. Usually, a major disaster becomes minor, and a minor disaster becomes negligible. The event happens, but no one gets hurt. If the car is damaged, the insurance can cover your loss, right? But if someone dies, no compensation can make up for it, right? If someone is seriously injured, it's hard to recover. Yes, it will resolve your disaster. Why do you make offerings? Your offering can help you avoid such disasters. You might even doubt a fortune teller's prediction. As the predicted disaster never happens. Because Buddha helps you resolve all these disasters. That's roughly the principle. That's how it works. So, always stay connected with Buddha. Chanting Buddha's name itself can eliminate karma and disasters. So, if I have an illness, chanting Buddha's name can heal it gradually. At least, it prevents new sins from occurring. When you frequently chant and connect, Buddha sometimes reminds you. So, many of our fellow practitioners, especially the older ones, regularly chant medicine Buddha's name. Later, they get a bad feeling before their child is traveling. They'd warn the child, be cautious, or pay respect to Buddha in advance. Often, they carry a picture of the Buddha or their master for protection. Then, their children attain protection, having an auspicious life without disasters. The benefits are due to our daily worship of medicine Buddha and chanting. Chanting enhances our spirituality, like communicating with the Buddha daily. The Buddha will warn you when your child faces any disasters. You'll receive the call from the Buddha instantly. So, the fifth point, which brings great merit, is to spread the great merits and benefits of Medicine Buddha. For example, Spread the Medicine Buddha Sutra, Medicine Sutra. Spread belief in Medicine Buddha, and spread the faith in Medicine Buddha. It includes explaining to others the 12 great vows of Medicine Buddha, and the benefits Medicine Buddha brings you. When you spread this knowledge, you are practicing the Bodhisattva path and helping others. Thus, the merit is immense. It can help patients recover quickly and make your endeavors blessed and successful. Therefore, spreading Dharma earns the greatest merit among all merits. So, I encourage everyone to spread it more and chant more. Believe in Medicine Buddha with a sincere heart. So, after doing all these things, we slowly start to move towards something. Turn bad luck into good luck, illness into health. Short life into longevity, and ugliness into beauty. Received. Thank you, everyone. All right, next, let's chant Buddha's name with utmost reverence and sincerity. Let's start now.
点头，红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠。卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈。天堂红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，天堂红。看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，天堂红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见。轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠。卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈。天堂红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈。被看见，马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，轮扎沙漠，卡德索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见。轮扎沙漠，卡
베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하 비엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 런자 사모 가데이소하
边，他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱在沙漠。对手哈，边他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡对手哈。天塌红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，天塌。被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见。乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠。卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈。天塌红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，天塌。被看见，马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，乱扎沙漠，卡地索哈，边塔红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见。乱扎沙漠，卡
te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te Lan ta sa mu Ka te soha Tien tha ho hong bay khan te Bay khan te Maha bay khan te 
베칸제 마하 베칸제 란타 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란타 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란타 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란타 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란타 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하 디엔타 허홍 베칸제 베칸제 마하 베칸제 란자 사무 가데소하
点头，红被看见，被看见，马被看见，冷的沙漠。卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈。天堂红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈。被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见。冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠。卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈。点他红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他。红被看见，被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他红被看见。被看见，马哈被看见，冷的沙漠，卡地索哈，点他红被看见，被看见。马哈被看见，冷的沙漠
Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu Kade so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha Dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze lan ta sa mu ka de so ha dien ta hong bei kan ze bei kan ze ma ha bei kan ze 
సాము
Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha Dien Ta Hong Pekante Pekante Maha Pekante Lanta Samu Kade Soha All right, let's join our hands in gratitude. Be grateful to the compassionate medicine Buddha, who rescues us from suffering, extends our lives, dispels disasters, and eliminates all illnesses and evils. May everyone's wishes come true. Received. I wish you happiness and joy. Received. Also, health and longevity. Received. Also, great wealth. Received. Thank you, Grandmaster. A story of making and fulfilling a vow. Chu Sanjiang's son. In Shandong, there was a family whose head was Chu Sanjiang. He was an ordinary farmer. Although life was fairly decent, Chu Sanjiang always had a regret in his heart. His wife had given birth to six daughters in ten years, but never a son. In the countryside, the preference for sons over daughters was deeply ingrained. To continue the family line, he and his wife had been trying for ten years, but to no avail. As they grew older, Chu's hair turned white with worry. When their youngest daughter turned one, the couple once again had the idea of having a son. They were recommended to visit the temple in the neighboring county, known for realizing wishes. Chu and his wife went to the temple with a mindset of giving it a try. They made a wish in front of the Buddha for a son, and promised the Buddha that if their wish came true, they'd offer livestock, grains, and lots of yellow papers, as well as a lot of gold ingots to return the favor. 
Three months later, a miracle really happened. Chu's wife became pregnant again and successfully gave birth to a big, healthy boy. The couple wept with joy. The boy was named Chu Fu Chang, which means a prosperous and fortunate life. However, Chu did not fulfill his promise to return the favor. The main reason was the high cost of the offerings required. Also, he was skeptical to begin with, thinking that everything was just a coincidence. As time passed, he totally forgot about it. Everything seemed to be going well. Then, when his son turned three, he fell ill with a high fever that wouldn't subside. He was on the brink of death. After recovering, he suffered a boiling water burn. Then, he broke an arm in a fall. A series of unfortunate events left everyone deeply worried. One day, a wandering Taoist priest came to the village. Upon seeing Chu, he sighed and said, Oh humans, but not heaven. And then winter came. While playing, the boy accidentally fell into a pond and drowned. As a result, Chu lost his only son. Devastated, he never recovered from the grief. Until one day, he met an old Taoist priest. There, he was told that he was actually fated to have no son. Because of his sincerity, heaven showed mercy and granted him a son. But because he never repaid his debt to heaven, his son had been recalled by heaven. This story teaches us to never make debts you cannot repay, especially to heaven. Otherwise, your blessings could be taken away from you. Your lack of blessings is not because of petty gods, but your fate. When you're blessed with something but never repaid your debt, your blessings can be taken away from you. Doesn't that sound reasonable? For example, you are a low-income person. Your monthly salary is only $500. You made a wish in front of the bodhisattvas for a raise. You need a raise because $500 is not enough. You wish for your boss to like you more and for improvement in your work performance. You wish for an increased income and you promise to build a golden bodhisattva statue. Or donate to a temple if such need arises. Say, your wish comes true and three months later, your salary is raised to $3,500. Coincidentally, the temple needs to expand its hall. So the visitors don't have to stand under the hot sun or rain. Also, the gold paint on the Bodhisattva statue has faded. Repainting costs money. You've got what you wished for. Should you repay the favor? I personally believe you should. Sometimes, it's not the bodhisattvas who help you directly. It could be the work of the guardian deities. If you don't repay the favor, there's an impact. The bodhisattvas might not mind, but the deities do keep records. You'll receive the messages for you to return the favor. The bodhisattvas and the deities could appear in your dreams to remind you. If you keep playing dumb, your wealth could be taken away from you. How? Heaven has its own ways. If you've earned $200,000 in the past six months, the deities will take it all at once, with interest. That's $350,000. That will be your medical fee for your, say, leg surgery. You might lose your job too. You'll be poorer than when your monthly salary was only $500. You're lucky you still have your life. Because what you owe is money, not life. You lose your job, no job, no money. That's what you get for disrespecting the deities.
This is very fair. You might think otherwise, but from what I've seen, I'd say. If you ask for a favor, you need to return it. For your safety, please do this. The old Taoist priest made it very clear. Chu was fated to have no son due to the karma and merits from his past life. Having six daughters is already good. How did he get one then? He asked for a favor, right? Moved by his utmost sincerity, the deities decided to help. After that, he was really blessed with a son. When he got what he wished for, he changed his mind. Maybe the offerings were not cheap. So he decided to forget about it. Perhaps the deities had forgotten about it too. Then, unfortunate events began to happen. In the end, the boy, still very young, passed away. It's quite pitiful. Do the gods hear our wishes? Not returning the favor when your wishes have been fulfilled. Is that acceptable? When you promise something, someone hears this. When a man says, I love you, to a woman, it's a promise too. It is. Usually, people ask, do you love me? That's wanting something in return. You know. Will you still love me when I get old? Or, will you still love me if I can't walk? You see, when people hold weddings in churches, the pastor or the witness would ask questions such as, Do you take this woman to be your wife, to live together in matrimony, to love her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, for as long as you both shall live, some people just say, I do, without thinking much. Why ask this? Because everyone goes through birth, aging, sickness, and death. Yes, death is final, but can you handle your sick partner? Can you handle it when he soils the bed? You can't afford to hire a nurse every day. You can't afford professional care. Can you take care of your bedridden partner? Most people can't when that happens. When a question gets philosophical, it becomes a difficult question to answer. When you love someone, do you only love them when you see them at their best? What if you marry them and they fall sick the next month? Your partner will keep wetting the bed, not for days or weeks, but years. There'll be a lot of cleaning for you to do. Are you really okay with that? Many would leave if things don't get better two months later. That's the reality. Treat your vows with maturity. Sometimes, it's not illness that separates people. Some would leave their partner who has been jobless for a year. That's not illness. Say, you ride a bike and have no car, while all your friends have their own fancy cars. Your girlfriend is not happy. She prefers to be in a car when the weather's bad. She doesn't tell anyone about this. Her parents keep telling her to break up with you. And you, on the other hand, are such a crybaby. The only thing you do is complain every day. How cruel your boss is, how stupid your boss is, how underappreciated you are, and how much work you have. You know, things like that. You keep talking about resigning every day. And then, you got what you wished for, you got fired. What happens after that? You lament about how meaningless life is every day. What a good-for-nothing partner. I call that a lousy person. I think if the woman doesn't like you very much, 
She'll dump you, and I'm sure about that. Now, let's not talk about romantic relationships, but parenting. A mother tells her 10-year-old child that if he makes it within the top 45 out of 50 in his class, he gets a reward. In the past, the child always ranked last. He worked hard and ranked 40th. The mother has to fulfill her promise. Maybe she could buy her child a used phone. A promise is a promise, right? If the mother broke her promise, would it upset the child? That's a 10-year-old child. What if her child is older, say, between 18 and 25? That's an adult, mature enough to talk back, run away, and even hit people. What would happen if the mother broke her promise? Say, there's a new phone model. The mother says if the boy behaves well. No online gambling, no smoking, no doing drugs, etc. He'll get the new model as his new phone. The boy indeed behaved well, but the mother broke her promise. How would the boy react? The child will have a breakdown. It might be worse than she could imagine. People whom you made promises to expect you to fulfill them. In Buddhism, people take refuge in a certain master when they're seriously troubled. For example, losing their job, diagnosed with cancer, possessed by evil, etc. Some would make promises such as if their problems are resolved. They'd become the master's slave for hundreds of lifetimes. If they survive a certain disaster, they'll give all their money to the school, expand the temple, promote the master's teachings, and build a golden statue of the master so that everyone may worship him. When people desperately need help, sometimes they voice their wishes. Sometimes they don't voice them. After their wishes are fulfilled, many forget to pay back. Some even go as far as to slander the temple or master, calling them fakes and frauds. Do you know what the result of this is? For not fulfilling your promises, and slandering as well as defaming the temples and monks. First, you will be banished to hell in the future. Second, all the blessings given to you will be taken back. For defaming the gods, there will be heavenly punishment. You will gain bad karma. What kind of disasters await you? Nobody knows. In this story, old Chu lost his son. Inauspicious things will happen. If you made a promise, you must fulfill it. The gods and those whom you made promises to expect you to fulfill them. Return a favor for each promise you made. Think about this. When you prayed for something and your prayers were answered, you didn't specify how you'd repay the favor. In this case, what should you do? Making offerings is a vital part of Buddhism. It should come from your utmost sincerity. What is utmost sincerity? It means the generosity that stems from a thought in your mind. A long time ago, temples and monasteries had their own regulations. Not all temples wanted monetary donations. For example, some temples only accepted food donations. How much should you donate? That depends on the quantity of crops harvested. With luck, farmers were able to harvest more. In that case, most of them would offer more crops to their local temples.
These temples, in times of disasters such as drought, where people had no food and were starving, would distribute food made from the crops they received. This is the way of most ancient Buddhist temples. Let's assume there were some really generous, wealthy individuals. They received blessings and recovered from some fatal illness. Some were blessed with great wealth, lots of money in gold. What if someone brought a gold brick to a temple? and wanted to offer a golden Buddha statue made from it? Like I said, each temple has its own rules. The said donor might not get what he wanted. It depends on the temple's needs when making Buddha statues. The temple might have other ideas, maybe gilding or gold plating. Usually, the temples wouldn't build a statue out of gold entirely. Do you know why? It's risky. What if thieves came to steal it? A golden statue, even a small one, costs millions. Cheaper materials were usually used to make statues. Wood is one of the materials. Most statue bases are made of wood. The outer layers were cladded, not sculpted. Firstly, a layer of lacquer is applied on a piece of wood. Then, it's cladded with burlap, with another layer of lacquer applied on it. Fresh lacquer is sticky like glue. That's how the burlap fabric gets stuck on in layers. Then, it's left in a room that is well ventilated, but doesn't get sunlight for 15 days. By then, it should be almost hardened. Once it's hardened, it's ready for painting and more burlap fabric. This is repeated until the body, facial features, fingers, ears, and hair are all formed. It's tough and sturdy. I have a piece from the Song Dynasty in my collection. It's not completely intact, with some details missing, but the main structure is still quite good and well-preserved. Apart from that, people also carve statues directly out of stone. After that, it is painted, gilded, or gold-plated. That's how it is. In terms of materials used, it's hard to tell by just looking. There are also statues made of clay. This is more common in northern China. Clay, combined with plants, wood, bamboo strips. These are some of the materials used. The statues made as such look real. Sculptors can make different models out of clay. The thing is, Hardened clay cracks easily. To prevent that, the ancient people mixed in glutinous rice and composite soil. This would make the statues more durable. To prevent cracking, fibrous material such as hemp is added. Roughly, this is how statue making was done. Clay statues made as such, if they're not sabotaged or damaged, or not exposed to rain under a leaking roof, could last for 700 to 800 years. There's also the casting method, mostly using copper and iron. Copper was more common than iron, as the latter rusts easily. There was no stainless steel back then. Iron would oxidize in humid air eroding and eventually decaying. That's why copper was picked over iron. High quality copper must be used. Pure copper casting doesn't easily produce copper rust. Then it's gilded. That's how Buddha statues last a long time. That's a little sharing about Buddha statues materials. For all givers, it doesn't matter what you offer. Be it food, money, or gold, things don't always go your way. If you donated a piece of gold, you cannot demand the temple build a statue out of it. Not like that. You don't get to decide just because you're generous. Maybe the temple prefers other kinds of statues, or maybe your money is used to buy food for hungry people.
Can they do this? Of course. People need Buddha statues, but not as much as food. Buddha statues, or food for people. Most of the great masters would prioritize the latter. All Buddhist institutions aim to benefit people. This is our responsibility. Every offering has its own value. All offerings should be used to help people first. Expansions and Buddha statues can wait. This is how we do it. How do we return favors? Say, your child successfully got into college. There are many ways to give back. If you can't donate too much money, consider offering your time and strength. You can go to any temple and volunteer. If you are a strong man, you can help with repairing or construction work at any temple. Or, some temples need strong guys to carry things around. Strength is another thing you can offer. You can offer your time and skills too. When a temple needs renovation, what can you offer? Lights, flooring tiles, electrical appliances, etc. You may buy things according to the temple's needs. Or, you may donate money and let the temple buy what they need. That's the better way. What we don't want is offers donating things we don't need. Or things we can't use. Let's do things the right way so that everyone is happy. When it comes to offering, you must know what the temple truly needs. Most offerers have no idea about this. If you have some extra money to spare, and you feel like donating $200, is it okay to do so? Yes, of course. This is the easiest and the most reasonable way. You don't want to buy things people don't need, and you don't want to end up buying counterfeits. They're useless. Donate what you can, no counterfeits. If you can afford to donate $200, then $200 it is. Same for $300. Don't donate something that's $20 and claim it's $2 million. Don't do this. This is not genuine, it's fake sincerity. This is bad and sinful. Show sincerity when repaying the Buddha's favor. It must be genuine, no deception. Don't decide for the temple on what to do with your offerings. That's being disrespectful and asking for trouble. If you truly want to repay and make offerings, it should be sincere and not superficial. Offering out of genuine sincerity, okay? You don't have to donate a lot of money. Donate based on your capability. If you're poor, don't make a promise to repay billions when making wishes. That's just nonsense. Those who want to fulfill an important wish won't speak nonsense. It's disrespectful to speak carelessly in front of the Buddhas. Be respectful. For those who face serious disasters in their lives. For example, serious health issues, I hope you can practice with me. When your health has improved, don't pursue other careers. Stay with us, help all beings, and spread our teachings. I'm suggesting this to the seniors who are over the age of 45, who are too old and too weak to support their family. Join us if the hospital can't cure you and you can't afford your medicine. What about young people? When your health has improved, you can still choose your career pathway. We should be people with integrity. As such, we must know gratitude and repay favors. I'm like this, and this is what I do. I owe my life to Buddhism. I'm going to benefit all beings in this lifetime. This is my way of repaying the Buddha and my master. I hope more of our followers can do what I do. All right, I wish everyone health and longevity.
Received. I wish you auspiciousness. Received. May your whole family be happy. Thank you, Grandmaster. Now, it's time for our closing exercise. Rub your palm until they're warm. Glide your palms over your face, from chin to forehead to cheek, without actually touching them. Rub your palms until they're warm. Part your fingers and firmly comb your hair from forehead to the back of the neck. Rub your palms. Pat your entire body from top to bottom. Pat your head firmly with relaxed wrists. Do it calmly. Pat your left shoulder. Then pat your right shoulder. Continue to pat your chest. Then pat your left armpit down to the side of your ribcage. Switch to the right. Pat your right armpit down to the side of your ribcage. Next, pat your abdomen with relaxed hands. Please stand up slowly. Pat down from the front of your thighs, knees, shins, ankles, and tops of your feet. Gently pat the lower back, down to the buttocks, down to the back of your thighs, calves, ankles, and heels. Continue to pat the inside and outside of your legs. Start with your left leg. Relax your wrists and pat with slight force. Then pat your right leg. Continue to pat your arms. Start with your left arm. Then pat your right arm.
After patting your entire body, rub your palms. Gently massage your whole body without actually touching it. Visualize that you are gently sweeping away the dust and worries. You are becoming healthy and happy. At the same time think, I'm closing this meditation practice. Today's class has successfully completed. Medicine Buddha shines the great light of compassion and wisdom across countless worlds, safeguarding all sentient beings. Sincerely offering lights to Medicine Buddha invites his love and guidance, dispels harm and extends life, transforms misfortune, eliminates worries, and brings health and happiness. Please visit the Bodhi Meditation College website to make the light offering. The light offerings for the living are Connect with Medicine Buddha and Medicine Buddha Loves Me Wish Fulfilling Lights and Auspicious Longevity Illumination Light. May Medicine Buddha protect our living loved ones, granting them a life of auspiciousness, happiness, and illumination. The light offering for the departed is the, the eternal residence in the Eastern Pure Land Light. Pray for Medicine Buddha to guide the departed loved ones, so they may attain liberation and reside in the Eastern Lapis Lazuli world, peaceful and at ease.
智慧。